America is Hard to See is a poem by Robert Frost. It's a poem about Columbus getting lost on the seas and finally, in a confused way, finding America. And it's also about American confusion. The poem begins, there had been something strangely wrong with every coast he tried along. He could imagine nothing barrener. The trouble was with him, the mariner. He wasn't off a mere degree. His reckoning was off a sea. America is hard to see. Less partial witnesses than he in book on book have testified. They could not see it from the outside or inside either for that matter. We know the literary chatter. Indeed we do. For Robert Frost presented the image of a simple homespun poet. The homespun part was a put on. He was a sophisticated and hard man. The Kennedys despised Eugene McCarthy. In 1960, McCarthy had the gall to nominate Adlai Stevenson to the presidency of the United States at the Democratic National Convention. The Kennedys felt that that was Jack's year, and it was Jack's year. He was nominated and elected and assassinated in 1963. It was shortly after I made America is Hard to See that I realized that Jack Kennedy had to be killed. It was not an accident. It wasn't a single lone assassin like Lee Harvey Oswald. I saw three entities. A, the CIA plus the anti-Castro, what we call now freedom fighters, the anti-Castro soldiers who fought in the Bay of Pigs, or by reactionary Southerners who opposed the theoretical ideas of John F. Kennedy concerning blacks. And finally, perhaps by those who knew that he was indeed going to wind down the war in Vietnam, not for moral reasons, but because Jack Kennedy was a pragmatist and it wasn't going to work and it cost him his life. In August of 67, uh, at a meeting of the National Student Association in College Park, Maryland, Al Lowenstein came down and uh, a num we were talking about a variety of ways in which we might be able to bring pressure into the war and uh, Al suggested that if we could put together a nationwide student operation, a base of a student operation, and that he and some others would try and put together a political operation around the country, that we might be able to find ourselves a candidate. As long as your dissenters, you're limited. As long as the opposition, once the opposition to the war became a matter of political opposition, uh, of course your ceilings were, uh, were off. This was what people didn't understand in appraising Gene McCarthy's strength. He converted a small dissent movement into a large political opposition. In the Hampshire office, the only exposure that actually was on the body of Lyndon Johnson, he had one nerve exposed, and that was the nerve that could be wrapped by votes. And the wrap that we could give it with this primary, using the right vehicle, either a, either a write-in campaign for Robert Kennedy or a live active campaign by Lyndon John, uh, by uh, Gene McCarthy. Now, that could conceivably hit that nerve and do what ultimately it did do. That was the basis, but we didn't have the vehicle until we had, until Gene McCarthy came on the scene. When we were looking for a candidate, I had gone one day to have lunch with Bob. We discussed it in some detail. And uh, he said, no, if I run, uh, the uh, Everybody will say that I'm doing it for personal reasons against the president. Uh, and Gene McCarthy's the person who should do it. Gene, and we talked a little bit about the problems of strategy. Uh, I remember one thing on which Bob was very wrong. He said, tell Gene, when he goes into New Hampshire, uh, to make this an adult enterprise, not a children's crusade. When he arrived at the airport, we had about 50 or 75 people meet him with posters saying, McCarthy for president, please run. We called up all the papers and had photographers there. Uh, and then after he spoke at the dinner that evening, uh, he didn't know about it, but we had uh, put out leaflets and put up posters about an impromptu rally for 9 p.m. outside the Continental Hotel where he was speaking in Cambridge. We got a flatbed truck, about a 1,000 people showed up, all with signs saying, McCarthy for president, run, baby, run. Uh, 
And, uh, and that was really the first McCarthy rally. I don't know what Senator McCarthy is going to do. I, uh, I'm not sure that he knows uh, uh, what uh, he plans to do. My decision to challenge the president's position and the administration's position has been strengthened by recent announcements out of the administration. The evident intention to escalate and to intensify the war in Vietnam. And on the other hand, the absence of any positive indications or suggestions for a compromise or for a negotiated political settlement. I'm concerned that the administration seems to have set no limit to the price which it's willing to pay for a military victory. I'm also concerned about the bearing of the war on other areas of the United States' responsibility, both at home and abroad. The failure to appropriate adequate funds for the poverty program here, for housing, for education, and to meet other national needs. I intend to enter the Democratic primaries in uh, four states, Wisconsin, Oregon, California, and Nebraska. The decision with reference to Massachusetts and also New Hampshire will be made within the next two or three weeks. Senator McCarthy said, Dave, uh, I'd like to come into the New Hampshire campaign, uh, New Hampshire primary. And uh, this set me back a little bit, and I said, well, can I announce it tomorrow? And I said, well, now I've got him. I'm going to nail him with a press release, and we're going to get this thing going. People began coming in, extraordinary people, people who, have, who went on subsequently to work in the national campaign, many of whom have become nationally known, graduate students and others who just said, here I am. And we said, well, for how long? You've got an hour, you've got day or weekends so I'm here. They sent us down to a little town called Salem and we rented a storefront and we couldn't find anybody who liked McCarthy or who we, who we even knew who, who he was. One minister was quite friendly but he said don't use my name for God's sake and anything because you know, everybody around here is John Birch and they're hawks and just terrible. So it was about one o'clock in the morning when I arrived and I woke up press secretary Cy Hirsch and I said what national press do you have? I had been because in two presidential campaigns before then in 60 and 64. And I knew a lot of the reporters, and I was wanting to know who was there. He said, we don't have anybody. There wasn't a single reporter, not even a man from the wire services covering McCarthy at that point. Probably our single greatest problem with Senator McCarthy was that his, he had no recognition. It was, we, we didn't want to, he didn't want to poll, we didn't want to poll. We knew damn well it would be too discouraging at the very beginning. We just People simply didn't know who he was. So I said, uh, well, we'll get a typewriter and a secretary and we'll draft something. He says, we don't have a typewriter and a secretary. And uh, it was literally true. There wasn't either a typewriter nor a secretary on the campaign at that stage in Berlin. So I said, well, I have a typewriter in my car, which I did. I brought it and I used it. And we typed up the statement. And the next day we showed it to McCarthy and uh, he used it. At least it was. And, of course, he released it to nobody, since there wasn't any press there. So then Cy si got on the phone. I said, now call up all the, call up the New York Times, the Washington Post, the wire service, and the network. Don't tell any of them that nobody else is here. But just say, why aren't you covering this? He made a major statement on the Gulf of Tonkin. And, and uh, I said, they'll come, especially if you imply that the others are covering it. So he... Uh, he called, first called the New York Times, and why is he called the Washington Bureau? Because they'd be more interested. And uh, he called and he asked for the, he said, give me the, uh, I have the desk. I said, hang up. So he hung up. And I said, now call up again, ask for Reston. I said, this fellow is you know, running for president of the United States, and uh, Reston has to be interested. To that point in the campaign, which was only three or four weeks before the election, in three days, we managed to see about 120 people was almost nothing. We drove down to Manchester, New Hampshire, and went into the Wayfarer Motel, which is the largest dining room probably in the state, in the largest city in the state. And McCarthy and a few of us went in to have dinner, and not one head lifted. Not one person looked around, I remember vividly. I'd never been with a political candidate before where that had happened. I think there can be no question but what the involvement in this war has done more to cause moral uneasiness distress and anxiety in this country than any international involvement, at least, in our entire history. If a man ran against the war, against the president, against the local Democratic Party, uh, and had a good Irish name like McCarthy, he would uh, 
he would have a, a much larger coalition of support than most people imagine.